Senator Singh. Thank you, Mr Acting President, Deputy President. It is an honour to have the opportunity to rise to speak to the Clean Energy Future Package in this chamber. After so much debate on the pressing issue of climate change in Australia over not just the life of this government, but over more than two decades now. And we have only to look at how long ago it was that state and federal governments uh, created climate change agencies, departments and, of course, ministers, um, a, a portfolio I proudly once held in my time as part of the Tas Tasmanian state government. Recent debate, of course, on this issue has been especially fierce, though, and I want to acknowledge at the outset the contribution of organisations that have continued to advocate for action on climate change, such as the Australian Conservation Foundation, Climate Action Network Australia, the Climate Institute, the Say Yes campaign, MICA Challenge, Al Gore's Australian Climate Change Ambassadors, Oxfam and the Australian Youth Climate Coalition, and, of course, the ACTU. This package is testament to their community action, and it is an honour indeed to be part of the parliament which will, because of the leadership of the Prime Minister, be responsible for beginning the essential and urgent process of bringing on the next great stage of Australia's economic development. There is no doubt in my mind, Mr Acting Deputy President, that both the current and emerging challenges of energy generation represent one of the most substantial considerations for business and communities and around all around Australia. Since, of course, the Industrial Revolution, our economy has shifted to one that is energy intensive. And for too long, however, it has not adequately taken into account the effects of industrial activity on the environment. Industry has emitted greenhouse gases, those carbon dioxide and equivalent emissions, at a rate far beyond that which our planet would naturally release, and far beyond which it can cope without something having to give. The kind of climate change we are experiencing, and that the best science tells us we are going to experience, the kind of transformation of local climates and extreme weather events, is something that we, across the world, have caused in significant part. It puts at risk agricultural production, coastal properties and iconic parts of natural environments such as the Great Barrier Reef. It threatens small islands around the world such as Kiribati and Tuvalu and therefore is likely to mean new waves of people seeking the sanctuary of dry lands as their homes are swamped by rising sea levels and in the process their cultures and their histories lost. It changes the habitats of our native creatures and threatens biodiversity. But human economic and social development is a story of monumental achievement. While we have risked and we overwhelmingly have gained improved living standards in greater connectivity between cultures and community and in the scientific and technological mastery we have over our surrounds, we have created this problem. There is no doubt but we have also created the means and measures by which to respond to it. If only we are willing and if only we have the sufficient drive to apply the spirit of our human creativity to the challenge of climate change. This package is about translating that motivation we have in science into a motivation in economics. This package puts a price on carbon pollution and creates an incentive for all businesses to cut their pollution by investing in clean technology or finding more efficient ways of operating and therefore in cutting costs. It provides an opportunity for clean producers of energy and goods, those who have taken into account their impact on the environment, to have a competitive advantage that is commensurate with their social contribution to the effort to reduce the world's carbon emissions. It encourages businesses across all industries to find the cheapest and most effective way of reducing carbon pollution, rather than relying on more costly approaches such as government regulation and direct action. It is a package that provides the spark for Australian ingenuity in responding to climate change. The scientific community uh, or the scientific evidence of climate change and the case for action to both mitigate anthropogenic climate change and ad adapt to its effects has been mounting for decades. And for some time now, the need for action on climate change has been beyond reasonable doubt, attested to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology and the Australian Academy of Science. And I want to explore briefly some of the ideas about the intersection 
between science and public policy by, providing, uh, by reflecting on approaches taken by the international organisations of which Australia is a member, including the Convention on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources, whose secretariat is based only a stone's throw from my office in Hobart. There is a principle, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, on which this organisation, which is charged with managing environmental resources, is based, the precautionary principle. And this principle holds that where there are threats of serious, irreversible environmental damage, lack of full scientific certainty should not be used as a reason for postponing measures to prevent environmental degradation. What this means is that measures that would mitigate threats of irreversible environmental damage cannot be put off by a minority view, nor by the idea that a measure of change that might be inconvenient. What it means is that we have to take threats of severe environmental degradation seriously, that we have to be mindful of the effect that we are having and the effect that we are able to have in redressing environmental damage. It says that we should use the tools we have at our disposal before it's too late. And there is another important component when we're talking about science and public policy, and that is the ecosystem approach. And I think it's worth mentioning a few words from the Food and Agricultural Organisation's definition with regard to fisheries. Ecosystem approach strives to balance diverse societal objectives by taking into account the knowledge and uncertainties about biotic abiotic and human components of ecosystems. The ecosystem approach means a number of things. It means that we need to take into account the full effects of our actions on the environment. It acknowledges that humans unquestionably have an impact on the world around them, often in unpredictable or unanticipated ways. And it explains that an ecosystem is an interdependent thing and that human communities are firmly part of it. But it also recognises the significance of serious environmental degradation now and into the future and the effects that recklessness towards our environment has on human prosperity. It says that when we risk our environment, we risk our own prosperity. Mr Acting Deputy President, I mention this because it is essential that the decisions that a good government takes are based on an understanding of the way that science and public policy responsibly interact. The bar for preventative measures should be set at that level of precaution. For the longest time, when it came to climate change, the willful ignorance and scepticism that continues to typify the coalition meant that these principles were ignored. Humans are divorced from the world around them, they argue, and nothing in our actions constitutes responsibility for the environment. The coalition would rather mischaracterise not just the Australian and global scientific community, but the very priorities of el or properties of elements like carbon itself. They would rather play disingenuous semantic games with words like pollution and natural than face up to the issues that a responsible public policy maker would take account of. The fact that is that climate change is a threat enough to require serious reform to the way we all think about the effect, effect our activity has on the environment. But the changes with which come from transition of Australia's economy into one which puts a price on pollution also have the potential to unleash amazing economic opportunities. In the early 20th century, in 1914, the Tasmanian government set up the hydroelectric department later the Hydroelectric Commission, to create the first state-owned hydroelectricity generator in Tasmania. Renewable energy has a long and proud history in Tasmania, not without controversy and not without its caveats, but what this history has at its heart is a recognition of forward-thinking investment in the infrastructure of the future and what that can create, the opportunities of, of uh, sustainable development. In Tasmania, the early adoption of hydroelectricity paved the way for industry to come to the state and access our cheap energy. Those days for, of the national energy market, hydroelectricity continues to provide Tasmania with the opportunity to sell premium, clean energy and gives further credence to our reputation as a state of pristine beauty. And of course, Tasmania was one of the first. 
And now these adopters, which represent a diverse range uh, of political persuasions across the globe, a huge body of global wealth and capital, continue in that vein through understanding of the challenges of climate change, through New Zealand, European Union and California, who have all adopted an emissions trading scheme. Other states are planning either provincial or national trading schemes like Japan and China, which commenced, commenced its scheme in some of the most populous cities in the world, like Beijing, Shanghai and Guangdong. We know other states and nations are taking other measures, whether it's in the Indian coal tax or energy efficiency obligations across Brazil. All of these nations realise that a new wave of economic development is coming and that they need to be part of these opportunities. The kind of jobs that we'll create from this, uh, of course, uh, are many and varied. They are new jobs, jobs that look and feel like the kind which we have been familiar with for a long time. The difference with the clean energy jobs of the future is that they do not have a use-by date. They will not be rendered obsolete when commercial, environmental and technological pressures mean that only the innovative will be able to survive. They will, uh, what I want to say, Mr Acting President, is that only ever it is a labour, labour that has encouraged to introduce the kind of broad economic reforms that are necessary to ensure that jobs in Australia stay competitive, that conditions stay decent and that the opportunity to find and keep work remains open to this generation of workers, their children and their children's children. Putting a price on pollution is about sustainability. It is about rewarding forward-focused businesses and giving traditional industry an incentive to think ahead. It is about making sure that Australia is prepared for the new types of industries and jobs that will allow us to maintain our economic prosperity. But most importantly, it is about a sustainable environment, making sure we pass on a world with clean air and clean water where future generations can breathe and grow and live where the quality of our surroundings contributes positively to a quality of life and where in generations from now our descendants might still take in the sublime majesty of our natural world. <laughs>